Hello, I'm Amara Jones and hosting a series of in-depth interviews here at the People Summit on behalf of Free Speech Television to talk with a series of interesting and engaging and important thought leaders and activists um, about a series of critical issues that we're facing uh, at this critical moment in history. And there's no uh, greater activist, no greater author um, or thought leader than Naomi Klein, um, whom I have, along with millions of other people, admired from a distance. We actually connected on Twitter a long time ago when she sent me a copy of her book. Um, and uh, we have stayed connected through then. Um, so I really, through Twitter, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, and just admire you for how much you've moved our thinking. Um, and, and, uh, terrific, and it have been terrific here. And we also want to start out by plugging uh, Naomi's new book, um, No Is Not Enough, uh, which we are going to talk about, uh, the way in which it's important to develop a really uh, critical and thorough agenda to push back against the onslaught from the right and from Trump. Uh, saying no um, is not enough. Uh, but yes but we is, do have to say no. <laughs> yes, but yes is enough with Naomi Klein. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad uh, to be with you. And um, I could I could go on and on and on with you because there are an infinite number of topics. Um, but I wanted to start out yesterday with a thing that you said, um, and it relates to your book. We'll hold it up again. <laughs> Thank you. So nice. um, that Trump is an is an idiot. I believe you said, or stupid, but he's really good at it. Meaning that it's it's actually an effective stick that's a political weapon. Mm. And so I'm wondering um, if you can just talk about why that shouldn't be underestimated and the force behind that. Well, yeah, I'm I'm worried because you know the, it's sort of the coverage of Trump is this kind of nonstop, you know, gaff, caught you doing something totally inappropriate. Um, you know, mocking how long he shakes the leader's hand, um, you know, just at just the sort of the, the non-stop Trump show, uh, you know, the gifts of Melania slapping his hand away. I mean, all of that, it's created uh, this narrative that he is completely out of control um, of, of you know, what his administration is doing, that there can't be any thought behind it, right? That there's no, you know, he's just this complete bumbling buffoon. Mm -hmm. and what worries me is that, um, you know, I'm not saying this is all some vast conspiracy and he's planning all of it, right? Like, I think there's some of it that he un has always understood as a showman that it's it's useful to have everybody focused on your dramas. Like, he has known that since he created his own celebrity around his extramarital affairs. Like, he understands that, like, you know, that, that, he that his faults are a part of his appeal. Yes, and that mm. anything that gets the media focused on uh, the drama around his personal life it distracts right. right from I mean the unsoundness of his business and now the unsoundness of his presidency. Right. So he understands that, and then there's all kinds of um, drama that is being inflicted upon him. You know, I don't think he's, he likes what's going on with Comey. Obviously, that is not his plan, right? But the fact is, while we're all you know, focused on the Trump show, for lack of, you know, of a, of a better term. I, look at this methodical transfer of wealth that is happening, that it's not at all chaotic. I mean, if you look at, you know, his tax policy, his health care policy, if you look at how he is implementing his infrastructure spending, which is all about privatization, um, if you look at the betrayal of the promises around Social Security and protecting health care, uh, all of it is this methodical, organized transfer of wealth from uh, low-income people, middle-income people, mm -hmm. to the 1% of the 1%. That's right. And that's not chaotic, right? I mean, with the gifts he's handing out to Wall Street. So this, so what worries me is this idea that there is no coherence, it's all bumbling, and meanwhile, it's like, well, this looks really coherent to me, you know? Yeah, I think... Um you are a big ideas person, and I want to turn to some of those big ideas. Um, uh, I think that you're absolutely right about Trump. Um, one of the big ideas uh, that I think is the case, and you wrote about this in The Shock Doctrine, which is when I first became familiar with your work, um, is the idea that in some respects that um, poverty deprivation are necessary tools for wealth creation. That is to say that one of the ways um, in which wealth is created is through this arbitrage, this necessary extraction of labor or wealth 
to transfer to the 1%. And one of the things that you did was to talk about it as a coherent, as you just said, project. Right, I think, you know, in the shock doctrine, I quote, quoted, I mean, the truth, this is not my idea. I think probably we should credit Marx with it. <laughs> but there was... You, um, you, you dusted it off. I dusted it off <laughs> and, 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 and showed how moments of shock and crises were sort of the midwife of uh, periods of mass acceleration. Right. But I need a better term than midwife because I midwives are some of the best people on the planet. The deliverer. Uh, yes. Um, the catalyst at any rate. But that, what you're describing, it, it, it brings to mind... A, a one of the figures in the shock doctrine who's a great Chilean um, uh, a for, he, he was in the Allende government great intellectual and economist um, uh, who was assassinated um, in in the in the United States oh that's right right and and he described Pinochet's project and the Chicago boys project as planned misery it was, oh, or was it I think the phrase sorry planned misery sorry was a phrase of an Argentinian who is also quoted in the shock doc named Rodolfo Walsh, who described the neoliberal project in Argentina as a project of planned misery, right? So that so that this mass stratification of wealth that was being imposed uh, uh, through blood and fire in Argentina was, um, you know, w was seeing this this stratification of wealth. The already wealthy were getting very much richer very quickly right and then you were just seeing this explosion of shanty towns and yeah he described it as a project of planned misery right and and um how that actually was tied up with um with uh loan rules from the imf that there was a there's a global project in which uh that type of pressure was in, that incentivized right in nations throughout the world which i think is really important well and also just that um you know, it, capitalism is a very unstable system. That's right. It needs constant growth. If you have, uh, if you have slow growth or negative growth, that's a crisis. Right. right. So when, so when you have slow growth, there has to be, um, you know, there's this constant search for, okay, where, where's the new growth going to come from? Right. And you know, this this phrase that you know we hear a lot now, neoliberalism, which is a phrase that was late in coming to the United States. And, yeah. Um, you know, for a long time, you talk about neoliberalism in the U.S. and nobody knew what you're talking about. Yeah. You talk about it in you know Argentina or you know anywhere in Europe, and it's like, well, this, this is what they've been living. Um, but 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 the, but but the, the the project of you know mass privatizations of the state. Right. Even what Trump is doing now, his infrastructure project. That's it right. Turns out the center of it is you know privatizing air traffic control, feeding. This is all about trying to get like a quick fix. Like it's a um, it's that's a quick way to get you know, a growth jolt. But it's right? a it's a transfer of public goods in which everyone has paid for and built over the years into private hands, and that is a giant um, wealth transfer. Um, one of the things that I um, wanted to ask you about in connection to that, in your critique of capitalism that you just gave, is that uh, this is the end of everything. Um, uh, climate change. Yes, your yeah. climate change book, <laughs> where you everything. basically argued that, um, and this is the book that you sent me, which is, is how um, we connected, um, that in that, that capitalism actually is the problem, right? That you're all, that everything is incentivized with the short-term consequences to feed growth that have these massive planetary problems. And I'm just wondering um, if you could just, because what you're doing is moving around in these different ways and how capitalism is actually really destructive. So with people on the environment, and so this is just another perspective that you bring to it, and I thought it was really timely when you did it. Well, so right, I mean, the, 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 and the problem is not growth in and of itself. I mean, there are positive forms of growth. You know, if you, you know, if we were to take climate change seriously, mm -hmm. um, we we would have to make huge investments mm -hmm. in the public sphere in mm -hmm. changing our economy, uh, transforming how we produce energy, how we move ourselves around, our transit systems, big investments in public transit and so on. And this would create huge numbers of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, it would create, uh, it would create growth in the economy. So That's it's right. not to say that you know, all growth is bad. What is so destructive ecologically is this idea that any growth is good, right? Right. Um, and and the sort of quick, quick and easier the better, right? So that creates an incentive, I think, particularly for kind of lazy politicians to just right. go for like the cheap and easy growth, like an oil boom. Right. You don't have to plan it, right? Like right. All you have to do is just sort of unleash the powers of the market. That's the appeal. Right. right? Like you'll have growth from a fracking boom, you know, and and. 
And that is a hell of a lot easier than actually saying, well, I'm going to govern, like I'm going to plan right. this incredibly complex transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And that's why the neoliberal project, which has all been about, let's get out of the way of the market, is in such direct conflict with what we need to do in the face of climate change, because we cannot just leave this to the market. Right. We actually have to plan this, right. and it has to be deliberate. Um, there will be some areas that grow, there yeah. will be some areas that contract, yeah. and we need this good kind of growth, and we, and, and we need to contract the parts of our economy um, that are damaging to people on the planet. But you know, here we are at the People's Summit, you know, which is the house that NURSE has built. Um, and one of the things I try to do, uh, and try to do, you know, in this changes everything, and also this project that um, kind of came out of that, which is called the Leap. Well, for me, it came out of it. It came out of an amazing process in Canada where we brought together. Um, we were part of a process. Because you're Canadian, not everybody yeah. knows that. Yes, I'm a dual citizen, <laughs> um, but I live in Canada, and um, we, uh, our, our little organization, hosted hosted a meeting of 60 movement leaders, very cross-sectional, very intersectional, to talk about how we do this transition in a way that is justice-based, that is about, okay, well, we need to rapidly transition off of fossil fuels, but we also have a crisis of racial injustice, um, we have a crisis, a human rights crisis right. uh, in, in the treatment of indigenous people uh, in Canada, we have a uh, gender equality crisis, we have uh, a, a, an economic crisis. So as we make this big transition, why wouldn't we try to build a fair economy in the process? Why wouldn't we try to heal the wounds that date back to the very foundation? of our country. So um, one of the things we say in the Leap Manifesto is that we want to redefine green jobs so that it's not just a guy in a hard hat putting up a solar panel, right? but it's really a celebration of the care-based economy, which is low carbon. Right. Like nursing is low carbon. Right, you know? right. Um, That's right. Teaching kids is low carbon. Making art is low carbon, right? Like, um, and, and so we want to you know, mm. celebrate that and say, yes, let's have growth in those areas that actually improve quality of life. Right. Um, because happier. Um, and, um, but we have to design an economy like that. Like, it doesn't happen on its own. That's right. Um, I am getting the rap signal, <laughs> but I have two big questions that I'm just going to press on. Um, one of the that I want to ask you about, um, so I was trained as an economist, and one of the things um, uh, that was popular at the time that I was in graduate school was neoliberalism, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, one, of the, one of the questions that I've been thinking about is whether or not, the, clearly the, the result of the thing that we've labeled neoliberalism is bad, right? That's not working. But one of the things as I was spoken, sp speaking with um, Congressman Rokana about, who he t taught economics at Stanford, was that I want, what we were told about neoliberalism is that um, it had to have two aspects. It was supposed to be free markets and a democratic revolution. And that those two things were going to go together, they were gonna bring in new entrants, it was gonna bring down, it was an openness. But instead what we got with the policies that were implemented was we got crony capitalism, we got a concentration of wealth, and we got an inverse of the democratic revolution. That is to say the corporations use their new power to actually shut down democratic processes like the ALEC and other things. So I'm wondering if the thing we call well neoliberal yeah. <laughs> So I'm wondering if the thing that we call neoliberalism actually wasn't the thing that was actually pushed. It was the term that was hijacked. Um, I mean, I know it's a technical term, but a technical issue, but I'm just, the, the neoliberal, neoliberalism, I don't know if it actually ever completely unfolded. It was hijacked and, con and it was an ex uh, a, um, a blanket for crony capitalism and authoritarianism. Well, it always was though. It always was. Ah, and, okay. I mean, All right. I understand what you're saying. The first laboratory for I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Was, was, was not a democratic country. Yeah. It was, not the, it was not the United States. I see what you're saying. In the 70s. It was Chile after uh, the violent overthrow of a democratically elected yes. socialist president, yep. Salvador Allende. And the, 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 the overthrow of democracy and Pinochet's, uh, Pinochet's coup backed by the CIA and then handing over the economics of the country to the, these to, to the, the so-called Chicago Boys, yeah. a group of Chilean economists who had traveled to the University of Chicago as part of an exchange program paid for by the State Department and the right. Foundation, a little bit of history. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, after being indoctrinated in this extreme form of economics that was seen as, in the United States, was seen as, um, you know, totally marginal and basically insane. You right. Know? Um, 
it, you know, Milton Friedman famously called Nixon in the 70s the most socialist president we've ever had because he was so mad that Nixon wouldn't listen to him. <laughs> they gave them Chile to play with. They gave them that dictatorship to play with. And that is not an accident. It's because these ideas are so unpopular that they've never been able to introduce right. the full package without some kind of suspension of democracy. That's a particularly dramatic case, but look at the country that has accelerated the most in the neoliberal era. It's China without any democracy at all. Right. You know? one, there are two things. One, one I just thought about, I hadn't even made the connection, is the connection between Pinochet and Thatcher, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Who, and so therefore- she was a fan. She was a huge fan of his. She was a, a big reason um, that he went to Britain for medical treatment, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, so what's interesting is that, of course, the... the We're telling it a wrap, but we could talk about this all day. I know. I, we'll I, I know. talking about Hayek and... Uh, the, <laughs> I just want to do this one, uh, yeah. move this one thing, and then let's come back and uh, finish uh, where we started. But on, um, with Thatcher and Pinochet, the rollout of the ideas of neoliberalism in the West is, was mainly at first in the United Kingdom. Um, and, and, and it's interesting that you say that it started in a place that was non-democratic, but one of the ways in which she got her appeal um, was by appealing to working class people in Britain to say, the state is the problem, we're going to use these policies to free you, we're going to privatize everything, and we're not, you know, we're going to tear down the state. Yeah. So in a way, there, democracy was used, right? It was, but, but um, she wasn't able to go as far as Pinochet. Right. right. Uh, but and there is this there's this there's this series of letters between Fr Friedrich von Hayek yeah. and Margaret Thatcher. He went to Chile, saw what Pinochet was doing, wrote to Margaret Thatcher, and I have to thank my friend Greg Brandon who un unearthed this correspondence um, in the Hayek archives and found these series of letters. Um, but but so Hayek writes to Thatcher and says, "You should see what this guy Pinochet is doing. He's doing it's fantastic." And she writes back, and this is in her first term and says, we could not do this in a democracy. Right. right. And she's done some of it. She started the privatization of public housing, but she hasn't like gone the full privatization of the state. Right. And her, her, her popularity ratings were in the toilet, and it was absolutely certain she was going, not going to win the next election. Then what happened? The Falklands the War. The Falklands War. Got right? it. And the reincarnation of her as the Iron Lady and all of this, and then she uses the momentum from the Falklands War, she says, we declared war on the enemy without, and now we must declare war on the enemy within, and that was the trade unions, right? So it's often sort of that this, the catalyst in democracies is often this sort of the, that, that hyper-nationalist moment right. in the midst of war. Um, so different shocks can play the role. The role. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so then this brings us uh, to, to land the plane. I'm, I could nerd out with you forever. <laughs> it's really, you know, oh my God. Is anyone uh, else interested in this <laughs> They will be, they will be. I mean, they clearly have been interested. Um, so. Um, one of the things you mentioned yesterday, uh, and we can sort of bring these together in, in, in the interview here, is that you argued that in the way that Thatcher used a crisis, that you believe that there might be the use of a crisis here in the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. to further an, uh, what we'll call an illiberal agenda. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about that. And I also wanted to just talk yet again <laughs> about your new book and to say, if no is not enough, and we can end here. What are the three big ideas? Because yesterday you made a big call for radicalism. You said now is the time to talk big and to think big. Mm -hmm. So, um, what are the three big ideas that you think are important for us to be really bold about right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the the big the biggest idea is integrated solutions, right? That we that we are in this time of overlapping crises, right? Yeah. There isn't one that we're going to pick and say, you know, climate change is the most important yeah. or, you know, uh, it, you know, economic inequality is the most important, or, yeah. you know, or racial justice is the most important. Like right. it's all important. <laughs> right. Not, and, and what we need are integrated solutions that radically bring down emissions, um, fight racial injustice bring resources and opportunities to the people who have been most excluded historically and in the present day um, uh, by this you know, damaging dirty economy uh, and, um, and and that it's going to create a more democratic economy for everybody right. right so it's possible to design policies like that and I'm going to plug our website the leap dot plug away yeah um, because uh, this is a, a, a you know a, a project that grew out of our attempts to find those integrated solutions. I think the platform, the vision for Black Lives is another great example That's of, right. you know, what is, how do we really connect economic justice, uh, you know, the, the ecological crisis and the need to heal the planet um, 
at racial justice, all of it together, right? That's right. And so, it, you know, in some ways I feel like we need to reject the logic of like ranking, like what are the top three, and just like we need a holistic vision. Right. And we need we need to we need to you know and, and and we're taught to do this ranking. You know, they do opinion polls where they're like rank your issues in importance. Right. right. Like healthcare, taxing, you know, and climate change is always the last one. Right. You know, and which is why the planet always gets <laughs> thrown under the bus whenever there's any kind of economic problem. Mm -hmm. So. I think we need to reject the whole logic of, of ranking to get to that, uh, to, to the big yes. Right. You know, the big inclusive yes. I mean, the, and, and the other issue, you know, being in this Bernie-ish space, you know, and I have so many friends who um, you know, have done such great work and, you know, you're walking around and everyone's got their old Bernie swag and all that, you know. But I, you know, as I said yesterday, um, I really do feel like there needs to be more introspection on the white left. I agree. Um, it, it, and we can't just be in this like Bernie would have won. I agree. Space. You know, if the, if the Democrats, if we're sneering because, you know, the establishment Democrats blame their defeat on, you know, Russian hacking and WikiLeaks or, you know, Comey or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, like, we can't just be blaming the fact that Bernie didn't win um, on, you know, the DNC and all the... Every, Super delegates. Everybody had, everybody yeah. had dirty tricks. That's right. Right? Uh, but ultimately, Bernie would have won if he'd gotten 50% of black voters That's exactly in right. key states. That's if exactly right. he would right. have won if he had been able to communicate to older women that he understood how precarious uh, uh, gender rights are, reproductive rights are. That's and right. And so, um, I think... I think we, you know, I, I think the best quote in this book is from Michelle Alexander, um, who, you know, is a friend of mine, and, and she helped me with the book. She, you know, she read it and, and gave she wrote the new Jim notes. Crow. Yeah. yeah, and she gave me a really funny quote, which is, you know, if progressives do not, I don't, we won't get it exactly, but if, it, it, you know, if, if progressives are not able um, to better connect with black folks and better connect racial history with a you know a narrative with economic with history us, yes and they better have elon musk on speed dial because <laughs> we're going to need another planet and i just feel like enough set you know and and i wish i could like have that projected on a you know big banner here exactly <laughs> as much as you know I, I, you know i think i think we got to really accept that critique in a big way big time yeah. well naomi thank you so much it's wonderful to talk to you um, nerds unite! Uh, if you are, uh, if you're looking for things to read over the summer, clearly read Naomi's new book. But the entire canon that she has is eye-opening and groundbreaking, not only at the time but even now. So take time over the summer to do that. And I, you're traveling around the country doing a lot of book signings. People can go to NaomiKlein.com probably to see where those yeah, are. No is not enough. Dot org. No is not enough. Tour schedule. Dot yeah. org. Mm -hmm. um, and it's Leap.org as well. Leap.org. The Leap.org. The Leap.org. Yeah. Um, so anything Naomi Klein, check it out. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank and thank you for being generous.